Who doesn't love a good crossover? Seeing our favourite fictional characters colliding for a variety of reasons can be glorious. There's no shortage of these movies, ranging from understandable to the downright stupid. But for all their range, there's one pairing I would never have expected to see. Sadako versus Kayako, the two most famous ghostly women to originate from Japan. Now in Japanese folklore, they're known as onryo, a term dating back as far as the 8th century to describe vengeful spirits, ones able to influence or harm the living. But before we talk about this colossal confrontation, we need to understand these legends as individuals. Because aside from having long hair and names that end in Akko, there's little else connecting them. So let's start with Sadako. A long-haired, TV-haunting, well-dwelling nightmare whose story begins on the Japanese island of Oshima, circa 1947. There's a lot of versions of Sadako, from novels and TV to countless movies, but as it's related to the topic at hand, I'll primarily be focusing on the classic Japanese movie version, Ringu, in which a psychic named Shizuko falls pregnant after sleeping with a sea demon. Whatever the f*** that means. This unholy union is what created Sadako, a psychic Lovecraftian child of the sea. The period that follows is a mess, but long story short, people were afraid of her and her potential power, and acting out of fear, a mob was led to her home, where she was injured and tossed into a well. Using her powers, she was able to live for another 30 years, trapped at the bottom in total darkness. Sometime between then and the start of Ringu, the grounds above the well were turned into a holiday lodge, where Sadako was able to summon the last of her strength to curse a VHS tape, using a power known as Nensha. This burns a mind virus into an object that can be passed to anyone that views it. Typically, Sadako claims her victims by stopping their heart, a power that's carried out by simply looking at them with her iconic gaze. I watched this movie when I was way too young and it f***ed my shit up. I had a little TV in my room at the time and I used to have to get out of bed every night and twist it round to face the wall or I thought the TV girl was going to come out and kill me. That's called childhood trauma. And speaking of old repressed family trauma, that segues onto the next combatant in this tale, Kayako. The Grudge, aka your missus when you eat without her. What unfortunate circumstances brought this being into existence? Well, that has something to do with Kayako's husband in a tale as old as time. A tale of jealousy. He was a little beta bitch, and after reading Kayako's diary and discovering she fancied another man, he got it into his head that Kayako was actively cheating and that their son, Toshio, wasn't even his. The long and short, Takio lost his rockers and decided the best course of action was a swift culling of the bloodline. This brutal event created the infamous grudge, a stain that haunts their old house, relentlessly cursing any and all that enter with certain death. In a way, both of these characters are kind of Frankenstein stories, monsters of mankind creating, seeking revenge against those that made it. Needless to say, they're a force to be reckoned with. Fire is established, let's refocus on this glorious mess of a movie. Sadako versus Kayako. This epic starts with a social worker checking on a client at an unknown property. Entering and calling out, she gets no response. Yes, yes, it's a classic horror movie start, the lonely social worker exploring a seemingly haunted area. Heading deeper, she eventually stumbles across someone. Having taken her own life, she's covered in thick black hair and a tape is playing on the TV, something that catches the worker's eye. So in spite of the literal corpse in the room, she watches with trepidation. Having her just casually standing behind this person without any ceremony was really well done. It's easy to miss at first, but once you spot it, you're like, oh shit, this woman's fucked. <laughs> the jump to the front does cheapen it, but it's still a strong start. It establishes that Sadako means business. This isn't a slow burner, it's not subtle, it's in your face, and this is only the beginning. <laughs> Across town, there's a lecture taking place, outlining some local legends. <laughs> Some are real Japanese legends, and two are so plainly related to the plot it's almost comical. You've got ancient drawings of Tengu and such, and then there's a f***ing Polaroid of the Grudge House. <laughs> but while discussing these curses, he makes a very interesting point. The time of death has been reduced to two days, in place of the standard seven in every other version of the ring. 
ここまで呪いの微量にとらわれているのかそれはこの本に書いてあります Damn nice unsolicited merch plug he's on par with the best of YouTubers <laughs> In the audience watching this lecture, we meet a couple of the main characters, two friends currently studying in Japan. Lecture finished, we move to the canteen where Natsumi asks Yuri for some help. Her parents' wedding anniversary is coming up and she needs help burning that old VHS tape to a CD as a gift. I wonder where this is leading. In exchange for five whole free lunches, Yuri agrees to lend her technological skills. Those lunches better be that gourmet rich kid shit, or you've really bummed out on that deal. The scene cuts to a young woman, Suzuka, in the middle of moving houses with her parents. They arrive, check out the property, and everything's fine and dandy. That is, until she gets a weird sensation. Walking up the road, she discovers something sinister is lurking nearby. As with the grudge's previous iterations, the house can only curse people that step inside. So if she keeps her distance, there shouldn't be any problems. Unfortunately, though, the same thing can't be said for our dynamic duo. <laughs> In search of an old tape player, they stop off at a dusty ass pawn shop. Finding the ideal machine, Yuri picks it up and hands it over. Looking down to find a ball of, well, pubes in her hand. Ignoring the obvious warning signs, they head home, set it up, and once powered, an old decrepit tape is ejected. Rolling the tape, Natsumi is paying close attention. But Yuri's phone pings, and in a hilariously true to life moment, she gets distracted and completely ignores the footage. Finally, Azuma's short attention span is saving a life. As with a lot of Sadako's lore, the tape is significantly different in this version. Out of the two original, I prefer the Japanese version. g o r m i a Weeaboo, but the Western take is just less scary because it feels like forced fear. They really want it to look disturbing, which almost has the inverse effect. Whereas the Japanese version actually feels like found footage. It's uncanny without anything overtly horrific, but that works in its favor. It's like something you'd see Nexpo or Wendigoon make a two hour video on, whereas the American version is like any old ARG you'd find in the depths of YouTube. And then there's this version, which was frankly awful. It's just a warehouse with Sadako slowly walking forward. There isn't even a well. I assume that they couldn't use the original for legal reasons, but I just don't understand why the one they would make would be so lackluster. The cursed tape is such an integral and iconic part of Sadako's identity. It just feels like they're kind of selling her short. Also, every bizarre sound you hear when she appears, like that thing that sounds like the vine boom. That's them. I'm not adding any of those sound effects, just for clarity's sake. Regardless, Natsumi's freaked out, claiming it's the cursed tape that they learnt about in their lecture. <laughs> Yuri tries to reassure her, claiming it couldn't be because their phone hasn't rung. And right on cue, it rings. Again, there's a creative liberty taken here. In the movies, the phone only rings when someone's above the cursed well. But in this movie and the American version, hey, Sadeko's got a great phone plan. Phone calls for everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Seven days. It's an entirely different entity in this movie that, while it makes her less disturbing and subtle, makes her far more dangerous. <laughs> from the phone, a high pitched screech rings out with the lights flickering, and from behind Yuri, Sadako. Buki Mina. <laughs> Across town at the shop where the girls purchased the tape, one of the clerks is telling her bosses about the sale. <laughs> Turns out she watched the tape as well, but she's wrote off the call as a well timed prank. <laughs> Which, you know, pushes her into the negative IQ. But in any case, that was two days ago. Keiko chan, nani ga utsutte ta? k 
けこちゃん。Disappearing mid conversation, the owners try to look for her, but it's clear something's wrong. Reappearing, seemingly possessed, she stands atop a tall shelving unit, and from here, she jumps. Hard cut to Suzuka, who's settling well into school. Speaking to two other students, they outline the grudges exposition in a far less natural way. If I had a penny for every time one of my classmates whipped out a deck of tarot cards, I'd be a broke ass bitch. Having been warned, Suzuka's now well aware of the dangers that lurk in that house. Question is, will she heed these warnings? No, she won't. Back with Yuri and Atsumi, they've returned to the pawn shop looking for answers. Speaking to the owners, they explain how they came into possession of the original VHS tape. <laughs> It's making its way through Japan, causing those that watch it to take their lives, and Natsumi appears to be next. With the realization of her impending doom dawning, Natsumi collapses, overwhelmed and terrified. But thankfully, her trusted friend drafts a plan. They'll head to Morishigi, their professor, to see if he can help the situation. After all, he is an expert, having written a whole book now on sale for $4.99. The story is very Sadako leaning. You'd be forgiven for forgetting that Keiko even exists for large chunks of the movie. But given that the grudge is confined to one little house in the center of Japan, I understand that it's difficult to just lose. Integrate it into the grander plot. But how and when these two will ever fight each other at this point is anyone's guess. Hmm? Waiting outside the professor's office, he arrives, book in f in hand, ready for the hard sale. They waste no time explaining their situation, and he absolutely busts a nut over the potential of finding a real curse. <laughs> He desperately wants to study Sadako, meet the spirit face to face, and just maybe get some answers to the questions he spent his entire life researching. Or maybe he just wants to sell the ghost a copy of his books. Who knows? No one's safe from this man. So Trying and failing to reassure Natsumi, he goes balls deep and decides, hey, you know what? I'll watch the tape myself. This guy is off his rockers, believe you me. Tape watched, he receives his ghostly courtesy call, which does little more than increase his excitement. I suppose having been laughed at for pursuing mythical creatures all his life has left him delusional when the chance of definitive proof arrives, even if it might cost him his life. Natsumi isn't happy though, seeing as he's more interested in academic gain than helping her. <laughs> And with Morishigi still distracted, Yuri flicks through his book to check out the cures page, where it claims to break Sereko's curse, you have to pass the tape on to someone else, which should mean Natsumi's cured, but unfortunately, it was Yuri that handed the professor the tape. <laughs> With no other options, Morishigi decides the best course of action is to hunt down a medium, one strong enough to exercise Natsumi and break the curse. <laughs> So he gets to work, which means the grudge finally gets her time to shine. As the camera pans, we find a child stood outside the house. On her way home, Suzuka stops and asks if he's okay, but when a group of kids turn up, she leaves him to it. From his body language alone, you can tell these kids aren't his friends, and to hammer this home, they bully him for good measure. What's that though? Afterwards, they force him to head into the cursed house for their own entertainment, further reinforcing my belief that all children should be banned, they're too cruel. Out the front, he finds a key on the floor and opens the door. Heading inside, he takes off his bag, looks around and gets an expected scare. This is the ghost of Toshio. He also haunts the grounds, although he's slightly, just slightly, less aggressive than his mother, tending to keep his distance and torment people rather than outright killing them. The noise he makes? 
That's meant to represent the family's cat, one that was also killed by the father, and that said, I have no idea what happened to the mother. Family must have had a, a pet cricket or something. Back at the house, the kid stumbles to the ground and covers his eyes, slowly pulling them away to reveal Toshio right beside him. Without any indication that something horrific just happened, the front door opens and the kid steps outside, braining one of the little shits with a rock before running back in. Question is, is this the result of possession or does he hate the kids so much he's willing to lure them all to certain death? It's never specified, but it's matterless because they all head inside to track him down. From here, it's your classic haunted house affair as these kids explore this decrepit site, getting picked off one by one. Until only one remains, the leader of the bunch, and he appears to have tracked down his target. He prepares to get his revenge with rock in hand, but not before the house intervenes. Well, Kayako clearly isn't standing on ceremony. Much like Sarako, they wanted to up the ante, make them more ruthless killers to build tension for their eventual confrontation. Back with Ryu and Natsumi, the professors managed to find a medium that might be able to help, so he brings the girls to see him. At an old temple, the tape's examined, and it doesn't look good. The medium's scared, claiming it's one of the most powerful entities she's ever encountered. Not good news for our friends, as tomorrow is Natsumi's D-Day. Regardless, the priest is up for the challenge and wants to help, something the professor bizarrely declines. Natsumi has a different idea in mind. Enjoying the land of the living, she takes up this offer and the ritual is underway, with the priestess chanting and straight up waterboarding the b****. The water here could be done to mimic the drowning of Sadako in some way, but that's stretching a little. And when Natsumi protests against these barbaric going ons, she just gets slapped. Then Yuri comes over and she gets a pimp slap for good measure too. Holy Moses, there's a slap fire sale right now. Shit's crazy. With everyone put in their place, the ritual continues, except this time, Sadako takes control, forcing the two assistants to break their necks. She then pulls Natsumi from the ground, causing the exorcist to go into panic mode. <laughs> Hold up, if he's the only one that can stop the curse, why didn't she just wait five minutes for him to pull up? I guess she lacks patience, but she'll learn the hard way. A possession takes hold of her, and feeling left out, the professor runs over, shouting frantically about whether or not she can see Sadako. Sadako! Unresponsive, she grabs him, and here we get the most shocking scene in the entire movie. <laughs> I mean, holy shit. I nearly brown my breeches. She headbutt the man so hard, his face got Photoshop smudge tooled. It was completely out of the blue. Such a bizarre visual and special effect. 10 out of 10 from the judges. With the whole room Bobby murdered, Natsumi drops to the ground, and when Yuri asks if she's okay, she's not all that friendly. Basically saying, hey, how the fuck could I be okay? A man just got smashed into a SpongeBob character. <laughs> Actually, Natsumi, I think you'll find it's all your parents' fault and their stupid fucking wedding. In an act of desperation, Yuri grabs the tape and brings it to Natsumi, telling her to gift it, hoping that in doing so, the curse will be passed on, putting Yuri in the firing line instead. Tape consumed, Keizo pulls up outside, a powerful psychic who's accompanied by a blind child of equal power. Or at least you'd assume so. No one dresses an all red drip without having something wrong with them. Keizo swaggers into the room with a level of confidence reserved only for the Yakuza games. Keizo-san. You see, he's not happy because Yuri willingly watched the tape. In this version of events, the curse cannot be passed. It's just a dumb rumor. I thought that was hilarious. Not only because Yuri screwed herself, but also for all his hard selling, the professor's book was dog shit after all. 
Handing Kaizo the money from the altar, he reluctantly agrees to help, and just in time too, because Natsumi's overcome by the curse, falling to her knees. <laughs> Using some kind of unknown magic, Kaizo is able to at least temporarily stave off the curse. These hand movements might look stupid. And I would have assumed they were just theatrics created for the scene, but if Ghostwire Tokyo is anything to go off... I think it's meant to be Kuji Kiri, an ancient set of gestures designed to channel energy, heal people and purify locations. And with it, he's able to <clears throat> unclog their throats. <laughs> While this power won't stop the curse, it'll at least give them time to formulate a plan. So they decide they need a curse of equal power to try and fight Sadako. And in search of a demon to help them, the two psychics head to the only place that makes sense. Sensing the powerful presence, they know they found what they're looking for the minute they arrive. Meanwhile, Natsumi has lost her darn marbles, going full bonkerino and uploading the curse to the internet as a bit of fuck you if I'm going down, we all are. She had a change of heart afterwards and tried to take it down, but in true internet fashion, it was too late. The video had already been downloaded and spread across the globe like a virus. <laughs> The craziness doesn't end there though, because Natsumi starts talking the most about ending their lives together. <laughs> After screwing over the human race, she wants to take the easy way out. Something Yuri doesn't see eye to eye on. <laughs> Rejected, Natsumi pushes Yuri, grabs a belt and locks herself in the hallway where she makes the brutal claim that if Yuri won't go with her, she can at least watch her, which is actually pretty brutal. <laughs> But before she can go through with it, Sadako appears. <laughs> Moving slowly towards Natsumi, she claims her before she was able to take matters into her own hands. <laughs> Yuri breaks the handle and pushes inside, finding Natsumi with a disgusting lock of hair hanging from her mouth and a distorted face. Natsumi failed to do the one thing she wanted, to stop Sadako from taking her life. <laughs> Calling Keizo back, he covers Natsumi and explains that part of Sadako's curse is that anyone trying to get in her way will be stopped, be that a priest trying to exorcise her or even a victim trying to hurt themselves. Now while all this craziness is transpiring, the movie returns to Suzuka sat in her room. For whatever reason, she decides to look over to the cursed house where she thinks she sees the missing child from earlier. With a misguided sense of responsibility, she sneaks out and tries to find him. Entering the grudge house, she looks through each room. All the while, we the viewers are biting our nails, waiting for the moment that shit hits the fan. But she's in luck, because she finds the child sat on the floor, facing the inside of a wardrobe. Yeah, let's see how that plays out. Toshio rears his spooky head, causing Suzuka to scream out. A scream that brings her parents running right into the house. Good job, girl. You've done killed them. <laughs> Toshio sits atop the stairs, making his shitty attention-seeking little noises. And for some reason, the dad goes to investigate, and this proves a lethal distraction. <laughs> Toshio jumps, landing on the father's shoulders, where he f**ks that man's neck up. Weirdly, the family don't seem phased. I mean, if my dad just got turned into a f***ing Pez dispenser, I think I'd be a little bit more shocked. But before they can make their escape, we get our first proper look at the grudge. Twisting and clicking her way down. She even somehow cut the mother's feet off before they can escape. Both parents are getting absolutely ravaged here, and Kayako is moments away from Suzuka. <laughs> but just before she can reach her, Suzuka's pulled from the house, safe just in time. Sadly, the same can't be said for her parents. So the two sides of this story have finally collided, and back at Suzuka's house, they debrief. 
別の呪いにかかってるの私の呪いとあなたの呪いをぶつける My curse and your curse will fight. No matter how hard they try, any attempt to contextualize these curses fighting each other will always sound ridiculous. But that is the plan, having these two monsters fight. The only question left is how will they pull it off? Yuri and Suzuka are two of them. They are going to be able to get the money. They are going to be able to get the money. They are going to be able to get the money. So they get to work on setting their trap, even creating a last resort in the garden, a trapped well with enough magic to steal Sadako. I'm sure the irony of the location won't be lost on her. The time, however, has come for the final showdown Curse against Curse, Sadako versus Kayako. Now, based on everything we just established, all they should have to do is send Yuri in. She's cursed, and when Kayako attacks her, Sadako will have to intervene. However, that's not what they do. Instead, both of them head into the house with a fing wheel in TV like a substitute teacher trying to entertain a rowdy class. Why are they doing this? I mean, obviously, it's for cinematic effect, but I mean, come on, it's such an unnecessary hindrance. Regardless, deep behind enemy lines, Suzuka plays the tape, bringing the two worlds to a head. <laughs> The house shakes and all kinds of paranormal activities create a sense of build up until. Toshio appears just at Yuri's feet. Something Sadako is quick to rectify. <laughs> Hair springs from the TV and engulfs the child, dragging him in. Perfectly setting up Sadako's iconic arrival where she crawls through the TV screen. And she ain't alone, because Kayako is quick to come and see exactly what's going on. Finally, face to face, things move quick, with Kayako grabbing Sadako and dragging her to an unknown part of the house. Of course, this isn't the end, it's merely the start of this royal rumble. As Kayako crawls back around the corner, Sadako returns fire. Using her hair, she engulfs Kayako's entire being before giving her the cursed Stankai. Blasting her into a thick mist of sludge. The plan's failing. Sadako is too strong, having the ability to eviscerate anything that stands in her way. Something Kaizo realizes, telling the girls to fall back. Before heading inside to buy them some time by throwing the cursed tape to a rematerialized Kayako. This entire section is the definition of that phrase what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? And I love it. Even if one of them are destroyed, all they have to do is rematerialize. It's a zero sum game. <laughs> Running out back with no options left, Kaizo makes the sudden and slightly shoehorned revelation that one of the two will have to sacrifice themselves. <laughs> After some thought, Yuri decides it's her responsibility and so makes her peace before standing on the well's edge. And this next scene is the most outrageous thing the mind can fathom. Tackling each other like a pair of f***ing linebackers, the two spirits merge into one gigantic Lovecraftian horror of no particular shape, with hair and flesh wiggling above the well. It stays there for a moment before heading down. And as a tear rolls down Yuri's cheek, the well's sealed. Standing back, the survivors wait with trepidation to see if the magic's strong enough. But as you might expect, this little ward is no match for the combined powers of two Onryo. With a slow pan, we discover a new creature emerging. A creature with the appearance of Sadako, but the sound and movement of Kayako. Needless to say, our poor heroes are utterly fucked. And that's the end. A conclusion about as crazy and intense as the concept would imply. But wait, there's more. There's a post credit scene where we get an all new tape. 
This confirms our worst fears. The curse is alive and well, and not only that, but the two spirits have perfectly merged, creating a creature of unrivaled power that will no doubt wreak havoc on humanity. Jesus wept. Looking back with the dust settled, it was nowhere near as bad as I expected it to be. Sure, it was stupid at times and some of the characters just seemed gagging to die, but this is a versus movie between two Japanese curses. You can't expect a completely coherent plot. Is it faithful to the original characters? Well, no, not really. Their powers and aggression are nothing like the original, but that's to allow for more aggressive fighting. They still managed to create some creepy scenes that highlight each of their respected features fear factors. Really though, the biggest part we need to talk about is the climax. After all, the entire premise of the film was these two fighting, so was it satisfying? Well, yeah, as much as it could have been. Sure, having them sprint at each other in the end was moronic, like you can basically see Sadako's stunt wire pulling her, but other than that, I was impressed. Their initial skirmish allowed us to see how deadly and unkillable they are without looking too comical, which is a miracle into itself. Then, having them merge into a super curse? Well, I don't think anyone could have seen that coming. It was a complete subversion of expectation. So yeah, all things considered, the confrontation was well handled, which is no mean feat considering how hard it is to make these confrontations not feel cheap and lackluster. I mean, we all remember the public outrage when Batman and Superman became besties because of the name Martha. Why did you say that name? In any case, I had a lot of fun watching this movie, much to my surprise, subtitles and all. And if you made it this far, hey, congratulations. I bet a ton of people just Stop watching the moment they thought they might have to read. Or maybe you didn't read and you just listened to what I had to say. In any case, thanks for being here, buddy.